Because so much of energy efficiency is about removing the stupid stuff from your building. Okay. They can get a little bit more technical than that, but that's, that's you know, the, underlying, the underlying basis of it. But the, um, so the, the reasons vary. So we could get, talk about a services upgrade. Um, after all, air conditioning systems in particular have a, have a fairly limited lifespan, um, which disappears relatively quickly in commercial timeframes. Um, we can talk about neighbors upgrades and the ability of that to attract better tenants, or indeed tenants at all. Um, and repositioning an asset for improved uh, rent and sale value. So we'll look at those in more detail. So services upgrades. Well, I mean, air conditioning plant has a, uh, a typical lifespan of 15 to 25 years. Now, actually, you could stretch that a lot further than that. But the reality is, is that a 20-year-old chiller is old, sad, and inefficient, okay, and is up for replacement very soon. And if it's up for replacement very soon, you can go off and buy a new one, and you can buy a good new one, or you can buy an average new one. And the price difference is very small. So you can get better service, less, less, less uh, breakdowns, better efficiency, just as part of the process of upgrading the equipment. Improvement of service delivery. Well, I suppose a lot of people have this preconception that energy efficiency is about making people sort of you know, shiver in the dark. Okay, which is the old sort of style of, you know, you save energy by suffering. Well, that's not actually what energy efficiency is about. Energy efficiency is actually about delivering a good level of service efficiently. And in fact, most of the studies that have been undertaken have demonstrated fairly clearly that the buildings that have had a lot of attention to energy efficiency are actually more comfortable than the buildings that haven't. And that's because the buildings that are working poorly and are inefficient are also providing bad service. And, and uh, so a lot of their energy efficiency, energy inefficiency, is associated with, again, as I've dis described before, doing stupid things. Having too much air moving around so people feel like they're in, a, you know, they're in a wind tunnel when you could actually have the air moving a lot slower. And, uh, and that saves a lot of energy. Reduction of maintenance costs. Again, if your plant is running 19 to the dozen, it wears out faster. If your plant is 25 years old, it needs more maintenance. So there comes a point at which the upgrade um, of, of plant for those reasons actually becomes quite viable. And improved reliability. Hotels, anyone from the hotel sector here? Right. Um, my experience is hotels really struggle with capital upgrade. Okay, it's not an area where people spend, want to spend a lot of capital. If, and if you're going to spend capital, you're going to spend it on paint and carpet and nice fixtures and all this sort of stuff. So the air conditioning plant really gets you know, down the bottom of the list. So I've been in a number of hotels, four and a half, even five star hotels, where you go there and say, well, you know, you realize that you're, you've got three chillers here. One of them is in pieces on the floor. One of them is looking pretty sad, and the other one seems to be going okay at the moment. So how do you think you're going to get through summer? And the answer is, by a hope and a prayer. Well, you know, if you've got 500 guests dependent on one chiller that you hope is going to work, that's not exactly a good outcome. So the uh, upgrade of the plant to improve the reliability can have significant um, uh, on, you know, on benefits. Moving, moving on from there and into your core business areas. In terms of neighbours, for the office sector, neighbours has become um, a, a key parameter, particularly for the, uh, the upper section of the market, um, where uh, tenants, large tenants, large corporates and government tenants are insisting on four and a half star buildings. And in fact, these days, people are beginning to make noises about five star buildings. Now, to put that in context, an average building, which is about two and a half stars, um, is uh, a building, firstly, which I have to say has got a lot of problems with it. And if you go take that building to four and a half stars, you're saving somewhere between 30 and 35% of the energy consumption. So it's a big jump. So if the, the, the issue for a building owner is that if you want to get a quality tenant, that, uh, that uh, is going to give a you know, quality lease 
with you know, 10 years on it or five years on it um, and be a reliable payer and not be you know, Tom Bloggs and Associates or something like that, sort of you know, Z grade tenant like you know, companies like mine and things like that. You want, you want a, um, uh, you, you, you want Telstra, you want the Victorian government, you want the feds, okay? These people are asking for four and a half stars. And if your building is doing one star, you're going to really struggle to get them. And in fact, I, I know of at least one organization that has a build it, that has a whole business model built around buying um, zero star buildings and upgrading them, up tenanting them, and then flicking them. Okay, so you, you, you get a building which is sad, sorry, and, 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 and misbegotten, uh, you, and you sell it eventually as a building with a quality tenant that's running at four and a half stars. Difference in, pardon me, <coughs> difference in value is very substantial and far more than the amount of money that you put in to, do the, to undertake the upgrade. So neighbors provide you a scale for asset repositioning. You take your building from the doldrums into being a quality building that can be, can be sold as an attractive asset, possibly to, to an institutional investor or someone like that. Um, we've yet to see the, whether uh, the CBD lighting system, uh, scheme, which is, where, which is the area which requires, or the, the federal government program which requires uh, the declaration of the lighting power density and control quality of buildings, whether that is going to generate similar drivers. Um, but it's possible, because every time you sell or lease a, an area larger than 2,000 meters squared, you are obliged um, to undertake one of these assessments. So sooner or later, that's going to, the, 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 the outcome of that assessment is going to enter the lexicon of the discussion around the lease. So people are going to start saying, um, I want a building, it needs to have a decent floor plate, I'd like, I'd like a nice view of the river, please. I'd like a four and a half star rating, and now I'll also have a high efficiency lighting system as identified under CBD lighting. Okay, so we, you can see that that list of, of tenant demands is building up. Um, there is good empirical evidence that buildings with four and a half star and better ratings actually attract better rents. So there's, uh, there's a direct outcome there. You can, you can make more money out of it. And there is also very good evidence that if you've got a quality tenant on a good lease, you get a better sale value for your building. So there are very strong commercial reasons for doing this. Now, most of you will also be aware that within the, the CBD scheme, the Compulsory Building Disclosure sc Scheme, there's also a requirement now to uh, neighbours rate buildings um, on sale or lease where the, the area is above uh, 2,000 metres squared. So that is also now forcing the declaration of how good or bad your building is uh, on sale or on, on major lease. So you can no longer hide it under the carpet and say, ooh, it's not, you know, it's nothing happening. Now, it's probably fair to say that the mid-grade tenant market is yet to <coughs> really drive uh, on the question of, you know, we must have a four and a half star lease. But I think it's occurring, and certainly the purpose of the CBD scheme in this area is to encourage tenants to start tenants in that mid-grade uh, uh, tier of the market to start asking for neighbours' performance as part of what they're seeking in, in, a, in the specification of a commercial building. I suppose one of the temptations to say, oh, but this is all a lot of work. You know, you know this building, it's 25, 30 years old. You know, can't we just dynamite the damn thing and start again and do something do something wonderful. In fact, I, I see a few buildings out there, um, there's a couple of examples in Sydney in particular, where they've knocked down, well, admittedly, pretty awful, ugly buildings, uh, you know, 70s classics of concrete and blech. Um, and they are, uh, they're, they're knocking those down and they're building a five-star neighbor, a six-star green star building to go in its place. You go, well, you know, actually when a couple of those projects were delayed due to the GFC, I was quite glad because I think ultimately that's a really bad outcome environmentally because you spend an enormous amount of energy knocking down and building a building, okay? Whereas if you can refurbish a building, you save a lot of energy because you're reusing all that infrastructure. It takes a lot of energy to build a building. So rebuild has a lot of disadvantages. It's got a lot of capital costs associated with it, obviously. It's got high environmental impacts 
uh, because of all the destruction and all the materials that have to be produced to, um, uh, to service the construction. To put that in context, the world concrete industry has uh, emissions that are twice that of the world airline industry. So when you think about construction, think about it on that scale. We think, oh, well, you know, airlines, big greenhouse problem, concrete, twice the size. Okay, so the construction industry is a major greenhouse issue of its own. More practically, if you've knocked a building down, you can't rent it. So there is actually a loss of rent during that period. So it's not just the cost of rebuild, it's the cost of actually having a hole in the ground. And you've got no guarantee that the final result is going to be any, uh, all that much better. One of the things that we've learned over the last 10 years is that it is possible to take most buildings, including some buildings that I have to say originally I would have thought were pretty much unsavable, and get them up into the four, four and a half star region. If you take um, portfolios like the colonial portfolio, which we started working on um, uh, in around 2007, they were rating at about two and a half stars at, in 2008, which is pretty much uh, where everyone was at the time. Their 2011 average rating is, is 4.2. Now, I know that portfolio of buildings pretty well, and it wasn't like they were all brilliant buildings. Okay? There's a wide range of buildings of a wide range of ages, some of them 30, 40 years old with pretty average air conditioning systems, pretty average everything. But it's possible to get those upgraded to the sorts of levels that we're talking about. So we can, if we can do that with an existing building, why would you knock one down and start again? Okay? We, can, we, can, we can make this, these buildings work.